Hello, and welcome to our webinar. I'm Bryant Lin, co-director of the Center for Asian Health Research and Education at Stanford. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the first in a series of monthly webinars about Asian health issues. I'm really pleased to, uh, that you can join us today. The webinar is co-hosted by our center, as well as the Stanford Health Library. Great thanks to Nora Kane and Stanford Health Library team for all their support and work on, this, on setting up this webinar series. The Center for Asian Health Research and Education, or CARE for short, was founded in October 2018 to provide co a common place for research, education, and clinical care support, allowing faculty, students, and community members access to funding, connections, and information about Asian health. Please go to our website, care.stanford.edu, if you'd like to learn more information. Uh, I'm really happy to welcome Dr. Fumi Ikeno as our first speaker in this planned monthly webinar series. Dr. Fumi Ikeno is a research associate in cardiovascular medicine and pro program director for the Japan Biodesign Program. Over the last decade, Dr. Ikeno has served as an advisor for the medical device industry and currently serves as chief medical officer of an incubation fund, specifically for MedTech, MedVentures, as part, from Tokyo as a spin-off from Innovation Network Corporation of Japan. He is also serving as a chair of cardiovascular working group of APAN, Asian Pacific Advanced Network, that contributes to remote education, research activities, and telehealth using specialized internet, internet networks. Dr. Ikeno is also serving as consulting fact, faculty and lecturer roles in several universities in Japan, including University of Tokyo, Osaka University, Tsukuba University, and many more. Dr. Ikeno has authored over 70 peer-reviewed publications and te textbooks and has been invited to lecture at international medical conferences. Dr. Ikeno is a council member of the U.S. Japan Council, which is a nonprofit organized by Japanese Americans. He has served as a mentor for Startex Med, which is an acceleration program for Stanford-related entrepreneurs in medical fields. And I'm really happy to count uh, Dr. Ikeno as one of my friends and has been a great advisor to CARE as well. Today, he will be speaking about Japan's innovations for an aging society. The talk will take about 45 minutes and we'll save about 15 minutes at the end for question and answer. And please put your questions in the Q&A box um, on Zoom. Welcome, Dr. Ikeno. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rin. So I am gonna speak about Japan's innovation for aging society today. Okay, uh, on behalf of the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, CARE in short, I thank all of you for attending this webinar. My name is Fumiaki Ikeno. I am a researcher at the Stanford Cardiovascular Medicine Department and the faculty of Japan Reach at CARE. Today, I will talk about Japan as an aging society. This is my disclosure uh, relevant to this talk. I am a co-founder of Aging 2.0 Tokyo chapter and the US-Japan Medic Frontier. I'm also a council leader of US-Japan Council. So this is today's agenda. So I will uh, talk about seven different topics. And uh, this is Mount Fuji. So Mount Fuji is one of the big, uh, beautiful mountain. And uh, this mountain is located in my hometown in Japan. So first one, introduction. So uh, this is, I, I'm going to talk about the Japan and uh, of course, uh, US mainly, and also oh, some a little bit about China. So let me start with some healthcare related number of top three GDP countries, namely the United States, China, and Japan. The US has the largest healthcare expenditure per GDP as well as a per capita. You can see 17% and Japan is about 11% and China is about 5.4%. And the life expectancy is longest in Japan, so about 40 uh, 84 years old, US is about 79, China is 76. So Japan is a very attractive market for med tech technology. Healthcare cost per capita is the highest in Japan. The annual growth rate of geriatric care is 8.4%. And uh, Japan has, a, uh, has had a, a universal healthcare system since 1961. This is very good. 
And the aging rate, which is the percentage of population who is 65 years old or older, is 28.7% in Japan, while it is only about 16% in the United States. This number is est uh, estimated to become 40% in Japan and 21% in the US in 2040. The main factor of Japan's such high aging rate is its low fatality rate. It's only 1.36 in Japan, while it is about 1.9 in the United States. Besides the low birth rate, the life expectancy in Japan is much longer than that in other developed countries. Another contributing factor is the number of immigrants. Immigrants to Japan account for only 1.9%. It means Japan is an ethnically homogeneous country. This video shows the trend of life expect expectancy since 1960. Since the 1970s, Japan has been ranked number one or number two. Okay, this is a list of top 10 countries with the longest longevity. Japan and Norway are the top two currently. In Japan, on average, females live six years longer than males do. So about female is 87 years old and the male is 81 years old. The national average of life expectancy of the United States is about 79 years old and about five years shorter than that of Japan. This is the US. So this chart shows the life expectancy trend of the United States since 1960. Very interestingly, it uh, peaked in 2014 and it has been declining since then. The U.S. life expectancy was broken down by ethnicity. So Asian American has the highest longevity, about 86.5 years. That's uh, interesting findings. And uh, this is uh, some kind of Japanese traditional food. It looks like it's healthy food. So, but uh, of course, these days are a little bit changing. So young people like a McDonald's and the junk food more, but uh, this is a typical traditional Japanese food. So next topic is advanced aging society Japan. So I took this photo at a small temple in the central Tokyo. You can see senior citizens are enjoying their companies on a sunny day. This is the center of Tokyo. So you can see lots of amazing people are enjoying. So this is a population pyramid of Japan as of 2020. Aging rate is 28.7% as I said in slide seven. And this number is the highest in the world. Japan is the most rapidly aging country in the world. 40 years ago, the aging rate was only 9.6%. It depends on the estimation method, but in 30 years, it estimated to become about 40%. Okay, this is a Japanese sweet. It looks like uh, not healthy, but compared with another country's uh, suite. I think, uh, I believe it's much healthier. Okay, the third topic is back to the future. That's self-introduction. 
I was born and raised in Japan. After my medical school and the residency, I worked as a general physician as a small hospital in rural area in Japan. So this is Hamamatsu city is my hometown. So I used to work uh, in the rural area mountainside of Japan near my hometown as a family practitioner. So this is a place. It's a small town and a small hospital. It's on, inside of the mountainside. It takes about two hours to go to the big hospital in the city. So aging rate of that town where I was working, working was already 40% 20 years ago. In 30 years, the entire Japan will be like that town I was working. If I go back to Japan to begin my uh, medical practice again, it would be like the movie Back to the Future. I experienced lots of issues in the advanced aging community 20 years ago. For example, many elderly people in the town were living alone, were taking care of their elderly uh, sp spouses, bedridden, and were demented. The most serious issue is a shortage of caregivers, social workers, nursing homes, and family support. After working for four years in the small town, rural town, I came to Stanford to do my research. As soon as I arrived at Stanford, I learned that this area was called Silicon Valley and the many innovative technology were created in this area. The experience at Stanford and the Silicon Valley have been uh, priceless for me. Uh, they definitely changed my life, of course. And uh, this is my laboratory, and uh, I developed lots of different kind of uh, medical devices collaborating with starting up company in Silicon Valley. And some of the product product is already saving many patient life all over the land, over the world. So this is a Japanese uh, uh, castle. Uh, it's uh, about more than four, I think, three hundred years old ca castle. And uh, there are lots of beautiful, uh, like a temple, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, buildings. Uh, it's very old traditional one. So the next topic is current issue in Japan. So this graph shows Japan's age distribution trend. The age group younger than 15 years old is blue, uh, uh, sorry, uh, green. And uh, between 15 and 65 is in blue. And the age group older 65 is orange. It is taking two working age person to support one senior citizen now. But in 2060, there will be only 1.3 working age person to support one senior citizen. Most of the current social welfare programs and the policies were called in, uh, created in the 60s through 80s. As you can see here, the age distribution was very different back then. The working age population accounted for much a larger proportion of the population. The age distribution profile has changed substantially last several decades, and Japan has become the most rapidly aging country in the world. The shift impacted social welfare programs significantly, less working forces, for more benefit recipient. This slide shows the growth of social security expenditure. The expenditure has been increasing and exceeded the US 1 billion in 2014, which is 2.4 times of that in 1990. Rapid increase of medical cost, including that of long-term cares for elderly citizens is a driver of the overall expenditure growth. This graph shows medical expense per person by age group. 
medical expenses per capita increase with age with exception of the age group 0 to 4 and the rate of increase accelerate among the age group 65 and older. Hospitalization cost is a gross driver for group 80 years and older. Most of the medical expenses are incurred in the final stage of life. Okay, this is uh, Akihabara, that's a famous place in Tokyo about electrical consumer product and also animation and the uh, uh, costume, uh, some strange costume people. So this is some kind of some new Japanese culture. And I move to different topic. The topic five is innovation for the advanced aging society. Of course, we need something innovate for the advanced aging society. So this is a we call Japanese in, uh, innovating the future. Of course, Japan is the most advanced country. So we need to create some kind of future. Japan's population is aging at a more rapid pace than that of any other country. Autonomous driving technology and home robotics are two promising solutions to this challenge. These technologies promise to provide people of all ages and physical capacity the ability to move around independently and freely. The latest AI technologies allow machines to learn from experiences, adjust and optimize their operations, and detect anomalies without any human intervention. We will make many of such machines talk to each other, exchange their experiences, so that they become more intelligent. These intelligent machines will certainly revolutionize the manufacturing industry. Cutting-edge medical technologies, including regenerative medicine, in which Japan is a world leader, critically rely on individual top-level doctors and researchers. This robot will observe and evaluate the changing state of an organism and determine the appropriate next move. This future robot with eyes and brains will exceed the boundaries of technology. Japan has a long tradition of excellence in the manufacturing industry. This is where we bring our strengths, IoT and artificial intelligence, to make revolutions in this core industrial sector. Advanced biotechnological therapies can be reproduced so that patients anywhere in the world can receive the treatment. Japan will break new ground for the future of humankind. Japan as a nation and society needs the technology the most and is the most prepared to adapt and embrace it. Japan now has the opportunity to lead this global technological shift and societal transformation. Okay, so this movie was made by Japanese government. So but anyway, so, uh, okay, so I'm a faculty of a bio design program. That's, a, that's in the entrepreneurship education at Stanford for developing new uh, medical device for the patient. And uh, in 2015, former Japanese Prime Minister Abe visited Stanford University and gave a speech. He emphasized how important it would be for Japan to collaborate with Stanford and Silicon Valley, especially for innovation. He held the partnership between Japan and the Stanford Biodesign Program that would train the next generation Japanese biomedical expert. So uh, in 2015, since 2015, uh, we launched a Japan Biodesign Program with collaborating with three national university, University of Tokyo, Osaka University, and Tohoku University with Stanford University support. So this year's sixth, sixth batch of the fellowship. 
and the more than 50 fellows completed the program and at least five starting up company were created by fellows. I hope those education program supported by Stanford Biodesign will uh, educate the future leader of medtech field. So, but what is a pain point now in Japan? What is the biggest pain point? Especially necessity is the mother of innovation. Pain point is of course painful, but sometimes it's good opportunity to do some innovation. The length of healthy life in the key is the key for the advanced aging society. Healthy life years, HLY, is defined as the number of years that a person is expected to continue to live in healthy. Healthy life years is also known as disability free life expectancy, DFLE. The healthy life years index measures the number of remaining years that a person of a certain age is expected to live without a disability. Life expectancy minus healthy life years is unhealthy life years. We can also say that is, it is important to, to minimize unhealthy life years as much as possible. In Japan, unhealthy life years for, for male are nine years and they are 12.4 years for female. In US, unhealthy life years for male are 9.8 years and 11 years for female. Unhealthy life years are not so different between the US and Japan in either gender. So this is a big problem now, pain point in Japan. How to manage unhealthy life years? How to extend the healthy life years without shortening the life expectancy? That unmet needs. Okay, how to manage unhealthy life years? The number of nuclear family has been steadily increasing in Japan. The model in which children, especially daughters-in-law, take care of their elderly partner at home is no longer the mainstream. It leads to the need for professional care provider, but Japan is suffering severe shortage of care providers. The gap between the supply and the demand will widen. The central government forecast that the gap will be 690,000 in 2030. It's a very severe problem. あの、お話ができると言いますか。ま、あの、相手が人間だとあ、そちらの方のどういう考えを持っているかそういうことをま、気にしながらあの、お話ししますからね。Okay, so as you see uh, this movie, so many robotics product and uh, service are being de developed and used in Japan. Most of them are for assisting care provider at nursing homes and the long-term care facility with bathing, toileting, and the moving of residents. If these robots are for care provider and the care facility, the cost can be transferred to the facility resident and the service recipient. The beneficiary pays for the value. 
there is another category of robotics. It is a robot for replacing manual work by care provider. These robots help senior citizens work, exercise, or rehabilitation, and the daily activities such as reading books and the newspapers, as well as eating meals. With these robots, care providers are freed from such tasks. We can reduce the demand for care provider. There are also robots for monitoring safety, safety and security of senior citizens. Robot and robotic service are being developed. We know there is a market for them. The Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare Research Group are estimated that 15% of those who were 65 and older were demand, uh, demented in 2012. It is about 4.60 million people. It also estimated that there were additional 4 million elderly people with mild co uh, cognitive impairment, MCI, which is a pre precursor of dementia. It means more than one in four has dementia for pre-dementia or pre-dementia. The ministry announced in January 20, 2015 that it estimates the number of dementia patients in 2025 will exceed 7 million, 150% 100, increase in 10 years. When you add MCI patient, the number will grow to 13 million. Some dementia uh, specialties say that the government underestimate the number of MCI patients by 2 million. Dementia is a very costly disease and the dementia patients are not necessarily physically frail or bed bound. Your first kiss? You probably remember it like it was yesterday. That's because we create strong memories of life's big events. But what about everyday memories, like your phone number or where you parked the car? These memories are stored in the hippocampus, the key region in the brain responsible for memory formation and storage. When it suffers damage from aging, illness, or injury, memories are lost, and the ability to create new ones is impaired. Working with the world's leading scientists, NeuroTrack has discovered a breakthrough way to monitor changes in your memory over time. It's called the Imprint Memory Assessment. The test is simple. It maps patterns in your eye movement and gives you a baseline score of your memory health. Based on your score, we'll recommend behaviors that are proven to prevent memory loss. You can retake the test every three to six months and track your memory health over time. Preventing memory loss is not only possible, it's easy. Take the Imprint Memory Assessment today. Okay, this company in Silicon Valley is developing a technology to detect early signs of dementia and to slow down in its progression. Japanese life insurance companies are doing a proof of concept in Japan in collaboration, collaboration with this starting up company. This is one of the examples of Trans-Pacific partnership between Japan and the US. Many companies in Japan are developing devices, robots, and the digital systems for dementia and the pre-dementia patient. The, their efficacy has not been proven yet, but I believe these technology will play important role in treatment, treatment of dementia. I look forward to more proof of concept study and the scientific evidence of their effectiveness. So next. How can we extend the health, li uh, health life years without shortening the life expectancy? The Financial Times reported uh, two years ago, Japan is now providing a model for century long living. It is perhaps, uh, perhaps no surprise that Japan has the world highest life expectancy and the more than uh, 67,000 people are 
100 years old or older. But Japan, the only developed country to have formally adopted the idea of century long living as a national project. The aging society is often considered as some sort or sort of social problem, but it is not necessarily true. As long as senior citizens stay healthy and active, they can enjoy their lives and they can continue to be contributing members of the society. The diagram showed a plan for, uh, for the so-called establishment of lifelong active society proposed by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. One of the pathways to achieve the lifelong active society goal would be extending the mandatory retirement age and the let senior season keep working. Japan is suffering labor shortage and this new workforce will help labor shortage uh, mitigated. Working means more income. Staying active means enjoying rights. In Japan, about one in four of those who are 60 years old or older have part-time or full-time job. There may be more older people who want to continue working. Let's look at the lifelong active society concept from healthcare point of view. The goal is to maintain wellness as long as possible and extending healthy life years. This chart showed the relationship between the age and the level of independent living. All of us age and become frail. That is inevitable. But the chart shows 10% of elderly people maintain their physical fitness and independent lifestyle. They must have great genes. The challenge is how to help other 90% of elderly people to stay active and independent as long as possible. And also many senior citizens in Japan are living alone at home. It is estimated that 7.60 million elderly people will be living alone in 2035. When they are alone at home, they don't talk with anybody. They don't or cannot go out to socialize with friends. They may, may be uh, reluctant to make video calls or even phone calls to their friend and the grandchildren. Lack of interpersonal communication advances dementia and uh, degrade mental activity. A study showed that about 30% elderly men who are living alone talk with somebody, someone only once a week at most. Provided morbidity of dementia in 2025 is estimated to be 20%. Lack of interpersonal communication will be a serious and urgent issue in Japan. Traditionally, local communities play a key role in service for senior citizens. Local and the municipal government provide resources and the programs are delivered in communities. Many municipalities collaborate with industries, academy, and the healthcare provider to carry out the programs. They use a human-centric approach for the benefit of senior citizens. In this digital era, more than 160 municipal municipalities are doing proof of concept smart city project in which they explore, us, uh, explore our solutions for healthy and active lifestyle of senior citizens. So this is a big picture uh, provided by our cabinet office of Japan. Society 5.0 will leverage AI for big data, analytics, including real-time physiological data and electrical medical record 
as well as data about the surrounding environment, healthcare systems, and the medical facility, as well as public health and uh, epidemics. The goal is to maintain quality of life of senior citizens, especially those who are living alone. Robot can provide not only companies to senior citizens living alone, but also assistance to caregivers as fac facilities as well as at home. Automated or self-service health checkup will help early detection of disease. Standardized and sharing electronic medical record across healthcare system will help optim optimize medical care delivery. This is a big picture uh, provided by Japanese government. The new Suga administration is going to create the digital agency in 2021 inside of Japanese government, which is expected to play a central role in promoting digitalization of Japanese society. Its responsibility will include digital healthcare and a digital solution for healthy, active lifestyle for elderly people. Okay, this is also very traditional Japanese uh, Buddhism, uh, uh, we call uh, Buddhism feature. Okay, the next topic is COVID-19. So this is a today's uh, number of the COVID-19 patient uh, and also uh, deaths. So far, since about February of this year, uh, more than 10 million uh, patients infected by COVID-19 and more than 200,000 uh, people killed by COVID-19. This is the United States. Of course, US is the worst country in the world. In Japan, the total case of it's much less. One, uh, I think about 109,000 cases since January of this year. And surprisingly, this is less than 2,000. So this definitely this is a, the number is different magnitude between US and Japan. Elderly people seem most susceptible to coronavirus. COVID-19 killed elder people disproportionately. The number of active cases and the deaths in Japan are amazingly low, despite the fact that Japan is the most aging country. How is Japan being able to keep these numbers so low? The universal healthcare system is one of the reasons. Everyone in Japan has an access to a hospital and Japan has advanced high quality healthcare system. Wearing a mask may be another contributing factor. Many Japanese wear facial masks during the flu season. There is a theory that the coronavirus strain are different between the US and Japan maybe but no one knows the real reasons. There are several theories, but nothing has been validated. The number of COVID-19 induced deaths in much less in Japan than that in other OECD countries. The prolonged, prolonged pandemic is affecting elder people. This chart showed that the physical activity level for senior citizens declined by 30% during the first few months of the pandemic. Stay at home restrictions are relaxed in Japan as COVID-19 is under control. But many elderly people are staying home as they fear contacting with virus. The decline activity may become serious issue if the number of COVID-19 cases resurge and the stay at home restriction get tightened again. Okay, so this is the last uh, topic, global collaboration.
The world population is ageing. Low birth rates and improving health in developed and developing countries mean people are living longer. In the next 25 years, the number of people aged over 60 is set to more than double, climbing from 841 million in 2014 to some 2 billion in 2050. In 2020, for the first time in history, there'll be more over 60s than children under 5. In 1950, there were 12 working-age people for every individual over 65 worldwide. By 2013, there were just 8, and by 2050, there will likely be just 4. This trend will have an increasing impact on global economic growth, savings and investment, consumption, workforces, pension schemes and taxes. Healthcare systems and social services will also feel the burden, as family life, living conditions, housing and migration trends change. Populations are expected to age at a faster pace in Asia, Europe and Latin America. Poorer countries without the means to prepare will also experience a significant change as the world struggles to support the elderly without imposing a stifling burden on the young. So, uh, this video said, so, uh, of course, uh, aging society is not only Japanese problem, it's global problem future. So here the population pyramid of Japan and the US. The segment of 70 years old or older counts or 11% in the United States and 21% in Japan, almost twice as much. But in terms of absolute numbers, the US has 36 million people who are at least 70 years old and Japan has 27 million of them. The US has more elderly people than Japan. Two thousand one countries were uh, stratified by the aging rate. The aging rate of greater than 21% makes a country a super aged country. When it is between 14 and 21%, the country is eight. And the aging rate between 7% and 14% makes the country aging. Back in 2015, Japan, Italy, and Germany were the only super aged country among 201 countries. It is predicted that in 2060, Nine countries will have the aging rate higher than 35%. Should we call them super ultra aged countries? Most of these nine countries are in Asia and the EU. Rapid aging is not a problem of only Japan. It is global challenge. The population of people who are 60 years old or older will reach 1.4 billion by 2030 globally. In the US, the population who is 65 years old or older is estimated to increase by 40% between 2014 and 2030. And the segment of 85 years older and older will be the first growing next 10 years. People who are living at nursing homes uh, represent 1% of the US population, yet they account for 40% of COVID-19 related deaths. 43% of senior citizens at residential care facilities say they feel lonely. 50% of nursing homes are running at a loss. 57% of family caregivers are chronically under stress. Pension gap in eight countries will reach 400 trillion by 2050. The need for innovation has never been greater, but there have been no unicorns starting up its valuation is greater than 1 billion before their IPO in aging and the senior care industry. The advanced aging society is not an issue only in Japan. Of course, it's a global issue. 
it will be fantastic if everyone can stay healthy and active and live their lives. Startup companies are coming up with many creative, innovative, and practical ideas in Japan, which can be deployed globally. In parallel, non-Japanese innovators can use Japan as a market for proof of concept or field trials. We need a global collaboration for our aging society. Here is my final message to you. The best way to predict your future is to create it. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ikeno. Really wonderful talk, very enlightening and informative. Uh, just a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to ask a question, I know there have been a few questions already, please uh, submit your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'd like to start off before we get to the, uh, the audience questions to ask a couple of questions of my own. Um, you presented many very fascinating and interesting innovations uh, to help care for the elderly uh, that are going on in Japan. How much of that is going on now versus how much is actually research and future state of all the robots and innovations you showed us today? What is going on now? Like if you went to a, a nursing home or a, a someone's house, what would you see now versus what's what's mostly in the future state? Okay, I think just robot and the robotic service just started, I think since maybe a few years ago. And especially AI and help the robot to become more clever. So I think now Japanese government emphasize AI and the robot, those kind of technologies should be more strong industry in Japan. And the next year, so Japanese new uh, ministry will uh, start found the so digital uh, ministry. So I think uh, maybe now it's just started, but uh, maybe a few years from now, I believe I expect Japan, for example, nursing home or local community or local government they will maybe use those kind of technology more aggressively for the daily life, uh, for the, uh, the elderly society, advanced aging society. That's my dream, or maybe it's maybe we are. Great, so, so kind of current and future state, I guess. Um, yeah. What, what are the out-of-pocket costs for care in Japan? Are these innovations, uh, you mentioned this a little bit about how much it would cost, but just for context for the audience, if they don't know, most uh, long most uh, elder care in the U.S. in the long term is out of pocket, unless you happen to be fortunate enough to have long term care insurance in the U.S. And that can range from you know the the single thousands to you know tens of thousands you know fifteen thousand sixteen thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars a month. Uh, so it can be quite expensive. So Dr. Ikeno, how does that cost compare in Japan, and where what's the out of pocket cost for patients in Japan? Okay, first, uh, about 25 years ago, in Japanese government started like a uh, universal uh, insurance system for aging care. So it's not totally separated from medical care, medical life, uh, medical insurance. So that's helped a lot. But unfortunately, reimbursement of that system is not so attractive for the uh, especially like a company or industry people. So the reason why, of course, they have to pay. So I think another uh, part of the some unique uh, system in Japan is life insurance company. So Japanese people culture, so they are, they fear a lot about failure or mistake. So the reason why the life insurance, not health insurance, life insurance expenditure per capita is the most. Uh, in Japan uh, compared with another countries. So, but life insurance company also trying to, for example, that one of the example that I show, Silicon Valley company, now they are doing proof of concept under the collaboration with a Japanese life insurance company to detect dementia and to prevent dementia. I think a life insurance companies are also uh, have a key role for Japan. And the relative cost compared with the United States, the care cost is much less compared with the United States.
markets. US is everything more expensive compared to Japan. But of course, a total cost is a lot because we have more Asian people. So that's a current situation. I think a relatively cheaper compared to the US cost for care. Right. We do, we do everything bigger in the US, not just Texas. Um, we've got a couple of questions, many questions from the audience. We've got a couple of questions from Colin Ong, and, and my apologies if I mispronounce your name. Uh, to what extent should or will entrepreneurship influence implementing a solution to the caregiving solu situation in Japan? Okay, so for example, uh, we started the Japan Biodesign Program about five years ago. So, and the most of the uh, entrepreneur, of course, are uh, focusing to big unmet needs. One of the big unmet needs in Japan is, of course, aging society. But the, the problem, on the other hand, the problem is how to monetize. You know, as I told you, so like, like an investment of uh, nursing or insurance is not enough. And of course, we can involve life insurance company but sometimes, of course, a patient or patient family has to pay out of the pocket, but those people doesn't have much money. So that's a still very, very uh, pain point for us. So, of course, everybody knows uh, the aging society is big unmet needs, but uh, in terms of the business, especially starting up company, the reimbursement or how to monetize, is that attractive or not? That is still a problem. Yes, uh, we have to fix it. Still, we are trying, challenging about that problem. It's maybe similar in the United States. Great. Great, another question from Colin. What do you see as the opportunity for school-age students to ease the caregiving shortage? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, that's also a good point. So I'm, I'm not sure about the center of Tokyo, but in the local city in Japan, especially small town, the people, younger people, especially like uh, elementary school student or junior high, those people doesn't have any chance to talk their own grandparents. But sometimes the city government or town government try to sub, try to establish some program uh, to have a, some kind of relationship with uh, aging people living alone, communicate with elementary school students, maybe once a week or something, and to uh, communicate and to, uh, to know each other. So that's maybe a good challenge uh, because elder people are alone. Sometimes they cannot see any grandchildren because they are living very far, for example, Tokyo. But at least they can communicate with younger uh, next generation of Japanese child. So that may stimulate elder people. And the, for the younger people, they can learn from the, their grandparents' age people about lots of different things. So that's kind of uh, bi-directional communication between elder people and the younger people becoming more important in Japan. Great, fantastic, thank you. There, there have been a couple of requests for your slide deck. Would you be okay with sharing that with the uh, audience? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. That's uh, all, all of the, my slide comes from almost the public domain, so. Okay, great. So we'll, what we'll try to do is but, have but it. PDF, please, not the PowerPoint. <laughs> we'll try to share it on the Stanford Health Library website. Yeah, 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 that's um, cool. Hopefully we'll be able I, to- I got the permission from Japanese government, no, no don't worry. Okay, uh, and then uh, the, the uh, talk today is recorded and this will be edited by the Stanford Video Service so that it will be online as well. Uh, next question from Kate Kanata. Excellent talk, what do you attribute to the growing incidence of dementia in Japan? What's, uh, I'm sorry, what, what's? Uh, what do you attribute to the growing incidence of dementia in Japan? Why is dementia becoming more common in Japan? Oh, that's, I think the uh, incidence is maybe very similar to United States maybe, but uh, you know, we are living longer, of course. And also the number of the child is much less. So most of the elder people living alone. So if for example, if I live alone, maybe 30 years later from now, 
I don't speak anybody, maybe just chat with YouTube or, you know, I don't chat with YouTube. So I think single living and the rest child. So it means most of the uh, longer life people, elder people in Japan living alone, it's like my mother. I'm here, my mother is 80 years old. She's living alone. But fortunately, she is very active to use Rhyme to communicate with my kids. And I bought Sony Ibo, that's a robotic dog. And she's sometimes communicating with robotic dog, Ibo. So I hope my mother is okay next at least 10 or 15 years, but still nobody knows. I have to pay attention to my mother because she's living alone. That's a typical Japanese age of people, right? Great. Well, you're, you're a good son, Dr. Ikeno. Oh, thank you. Uh, from Deirdre uh, Conley, what percent of elderly, this is this question is relevant to a webinar on Zoom, uh, what percent of elderly currently have robots to help at home and what percent of elderly use telehealth and automated healthcare checkups in Japan and the US? Okay, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure about the US, but Japan is, uh, especially after COVID-19, before COVID-19, telehealth is less than 1%. I think US is less than 5%, but uh, now COVID-19, I think US, US is about 45% and Japan is about maybe 40%. And now last week, Japanese government discussed to change the law. I think uh, after, according to the Japanese newspaper, Japanese government allow the clinic and the patient uh, to use a remote uh, technology from the initial visiting to the clinic. So that's a big difference. But of course, chronic disease, not acute disease, chronic disease, for example, it's very common now uh, using the video technology uh, to see the doctors and the doctor to see the patient because of the COVID-19 but COVID-19 may continue next uh, another one or two years. Maybe after that, it will become more standard way. So that's my estimation. Great. Uh, we have two minutes left. I think we'll have time for one or two more questions from Richard Liang. Uh, Hi, Dr. Kano. Thanks for your fascinating presentation. Your points about global collaboration really resonated with me. I'm curious, how do you see cultural differences playing a role in limiting or maybe accelerating adoption of tech for these aging populations across different countries? Yes, that's a good point. So I think uh, I'm a, a, a co-founder of the Aging 2.0 Japan chapter. So Aging 2.0 is uh, San Francisco located uh, non-profit, I think profit organization to gather all of the information of the technology and innovation for aging society. So, but I emphasize, of course, for example, I have a lots of experience between Japan and the US. So for example, US technology, US robot. So that's very pop, for example, US elder people, American elder people like that robot. But the company, Japanese company tried to import that robot to Japan. But Japanese elder people say, oh, this is a peer, uh, this is very, uh, you know, not so, friendly and uh, I don't like this face, I don't like this robot or something. So each culture has each preferable like a type of, uh, especially elder people. Young people is totally different. They like iPhone and the gaming, but elder people, they don't change their, you know, like a hobby or a culture or some, something. So you have to optimize before coming to the different countries market, you have to search and you have to optimize. The reason why proof of concept study, small proof of concept study is very important to go to another countries. That's the concept of aging 2.0. Great, thank you, Dr. Ikeno. Uh, I think unfortunately we're out of time. I hopefully we can save these questions and perhaps we can try to ask if you would uh, favor us with answering these questions, maybe offline and in a uh, written format as well. I'd like to thank our audience for attending. Again, this, this uh, talk was recorded and will be available online on the Stanford Health Library website. 
I'd like to uh, give, uh, because we're on Zoom, uh, Dr. Ikeno can't hear the live applause, so I'd like to give at least a one person applause to Dr. Ikeno. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for your time today. Please join us uh, next month. Dr. Giulietta Gaviola, one of our longtime faculty, will be talking about how she uses mobile technology to address, to address healthcare disparities in impoverished areas in Japan. So this will be in one month. And please, if you have any questions about the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, please go to our website, care.stanford.edu. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great week. <laughs>